My name is Jörg Rieger. I'm a professor of theology at uh, SMU Perkins School of Theology. And I've um, been a participant in this conference on ecology and uh, the future of the Earth, climate change. This is a large conference that had 80 sections and uh, very many different people talking about uh, what matters. Uh, what was interesting to me was that it was an international group. I was in two different working groups and um, one of those, uh, a third of the group was from China. So we had uh, lots of interesting encounters. Uh, that particular group talked about the relevance of Whitehead and Marx to the ecological crisis. Uh, a lot of people here at the conference talk about Whitehead's philosophy but there are other philosophies out there that, that are also of interest. Another uh, track I was in was talking on um, issues about uh, race, class, gender, how that affects the environment. And um, that too had some interesting results because we realized how the environment uh, really um, has different implications for different people. So for instance, uh, if you're poor, uh, it's a lot more difficult to protect yourself from the consequences of climate change. If you're living in a minority community, especially in the United States, you're more likely uh, to find yourself in close proximity to factories, planes, uh, you know, that poison the air, uh, perhaps landfills. There's a consequence of uh, ecology that uh, those of us who live fairly sheltered middle-class lives oftentimes don't see and, and that too has to be realized. Because what I um, again realized at this conference, we're all in this together. Say a little bit about your prior theological journey into eco-theological emphasis. I, I grew up in Germany at a time when the ecological awareness was really emerging and um, became very popular, very broad. So I was involved in eco-theological issues, mm -hmm. ecological issues, early on, probably as early as the 1970s. Um, when I came to the United States, uh, my horizons broadened in, in various different ways because uh, I realized that, of course, the environment was a problem peace was a problem that was one of my other German commitments but you also had to deal with issues of race racial diversity uh, we see that these days with the Ferguson events realizing that black lives matter mm -hmm. um, class is an issue because of the growing uh, differences between the rich and the poor and and we're so much worse off than we were in the 1970s and certainly in Germany it was a relatively egalitarian system compared to what we have today and I'm not just talking about global differences I'm talking about differences right here and right now so the challenge for me was how do I bring this all together and for a while it seemed like environmental ecological concerns were basically for people who had nothing else to worry about mm -hmm. right <laughs> there were some people that had to worry about daily survival there were some people that had to worry about being shot in the streets then there were some people, uh, you know, that worried about, you know, trees and shrubs or something like that. <laughs> that uh, that was important uh, to be sure, but not quite as existential as these other concerns. Yes. Who have you found in theological circles who have helped shape your eco theology? Let me start with ecology because okay. um, yeah. what really brought me back uh, or helped me kind of revitalize my own uh, ecological and environmental concerns was uh, discussions that had to do with, say, um, environmental racism. This is a term that's, that's oftentimes used. Uh, and, and again, that's I mentioned that earlier. That's mm -hmm. talking about how racial minority um, communities are oftentimes much more exposed to uh, environmental stress and problems. And so uh, through reading that kind of material, uh, through dealing with who is really affected by it and who is not as immediately affected, I, I realized how, how it all came together. And also my, my recent work, uh, like for instance, this book on Occupy Religion or a book on theology, religion and class, um, doesn't directly deal with ecology. It's not always part of my concern. So, so that's, mm -hmm. that's something 
that uh, you cannot ultimately separate. Once right. you realize that the ecologic, ecological crisis is not an accident, this is not just happening for no good reason, but right. there's someone behind it, someone is benefiting from this, somebody is making a lot of money. And it's not just money, the class issue is never just how much money you have, but also how much power you have. So some people are uh, augmenting their power on the back of other people and on the back of the natural world exploiting it uh, and, and these these uh, two things are, are really very much related exploitation of people exploitation of the environment yeah and whose natural whose part of the natural world are you are you messing with you know it tends not to be the neighborhood of the of the one percent that's right being fouled. so I, I said yeah. this to, to really to get to your question uh, yeah. which which one of the theologians uh, do I find uh, helpful now here I have to say um, there are not that many theologians talking about that. Right. Uh, so you know uh, we, we we have people like John Cobb who's done a great deal of work. We have people like Larry Rasmussen uh, who has uh, talked about ecology and justice, which I think is very important. Uh, Rosemary Ruther has worked on the mm -hmm. topic. Um, one of my colleagues at SMU. Um, Karen Baker Fletcher has also addressed issues of ecology and the environment. Mm -hmm. um, there's a whole uh, project uh, that's interreligious that uh, is on, on religion and nature. There's a journal of religion and nature. Yeah. Uh, there's an encyclopedia of religion and nature to which I also contributed. Mm -hmm. uh, but to be honest, I think um, that's the issue that we're not yet addressing at full force in, in the theological discourse. So um, years ago I, I wrote an article on that uh, and um, I think that's one of the few articles that really addresses uh, the class and uh, environmental racism issue full force. Th there are other examples, uh, let's look outside of the United States. In Europe, uh, you have people like Jürgen Maltmann who also mm -hmm. have some environmental awareness. In Latin America, um, Leonardo Boff, of course, uh, is, is a big one who's also talked about uh, ecological issues. Right. Cry of the Earth, Cry of the Poor. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah. so in Boff, that's the title, right? That's yeah. the title of one of his books, yes. Cry of the Earth, Cry of the Poor. But even in Boff, uh, let, let me uh, push this a little bit. Okay. Uh, and this is what I said in my article published about 10 years ago. Even Boff um, moves too quickly from one to the next. In other words, so he then moves into cosmology, he has the big picture, which is all great, which uh -huh. we need, uh, closely related to the process theologians, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, the poor, uh, the cry of the poor, almost seems like just a stepping stone to that. What, what I would like to know is, how does our whole cosmology change when viewed uh, through the eyes of the poor, when viewed through the eyes of um, minority communities uh, and, and we're not quite there yet so this is something that I think we still have to work out and something that um, some of the work groups at the conference here touched but it wasn't a central topic yeah um, but I was, I was thinking about eschatology mm -hmm. you know, do we need a new eco-centered eschatology or, or, a, or an eschatology in this setting that we're, we find ourselves in now that's a great question, yeah. yes. Uh, the problem with eschatology in, in our time is that for a lot of people this is almost like an escape from the Earth. Yeah. So it's like spaceship eschatology, you right. know, you, you enter the spaceship and you leave it all behind right. and you go to a different place. Uh, I remember, you know, when, when I grew up, this is back to Germany now, I grew up as a Methodist there, there were some people in our church who believed that uh, if we destroyed the earth sooner, Jesus would come right. back sooner. Right. Uh, I remember a colleague in seminary, when I was a seminary student in Germany, in this Methodist seminary, uh, who would always, he had one of these uh, Passat diesels, and he would always, when he drove home, uh, floor the pedal, uh, go as fast as I could, you can do that on the German Autobahn, right. <laughs> go about 100 miles an hour with this little diesel engine, because he said, if, if I make a lot of smoke and smog, uh, this will ultimately lead yeah, to Jesus coming Jesus back sooner. Coming. So, so in that sense, uh, eschatology has oftentimes been anti-ecological, anti-environmental, because uh, people separate 
spirit and body in a strange way. Now, in philosophy, there's lots of precedent for separating spirit and body. Um, mm -hmm. That's one thing you find in Greek philosophy, for instance. Uh, there are other philosophies, uh, dualistic philosophies, also religious approaches uh, that do that. But in the Jewish traditions, uh, that's not that common. Uh, yeah. It's not about spirit versus body, but it's, it's, it's a holistic thing. In the resurrection, uh, this is now the Christian tradition built on these Jewish traditions. It's not that Jesus' spirit is re resurrected and the body somehow goes away, but it's, it's, it's a holistic thing, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus gets resurrected body, spirit, soul, the whole nine yards, you know, everything comes together. And so I think that's the whole point of eschatology in this Jewish Christian paradigm, that it's not about let the body perish, but uh, it's, it's, it's a holistic event where um, bodies are resurrected, relationships are resurrected. And then in the book of Revelation, you have this notion that, um, you know, John uh, sees a new, heaven, a new heaven and a new earth. So it's not just, oh, we're disappearing into thin air uh, or somewhere above the clouds, but we're talking about a new heaven and a new earth, uh, which includes everything. Uh, yep. Nature, plants, animals, people. Yeah, both uh, Brian McLaren, when I asked him this, and, and Larry Rasmussen both made reference to the new heaven and the new earth. It came down to earth, not the other way around. It's not the escapist route. Exactly, it's the, it's yes, the yes. Coming down and restoring. So, our Jewish and Christian hope is, is really beautiful because it, 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 it uh, talks about an eschatology uh, where God, of course, is at the center, but uh, where, where everything is restored. And our hope then is, is really not for another world, but for this world. In, in Jesus' message, you find this early on in the Gospels when Jesus introduces himself in the Gospel of Luke, uh, and then it gets repeated in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, there's this notion that Jesus says, uh, I'm here to bring good news to the poor. And oftentimes you wonder, what, what is it to bring good news to the poor? So this is now eschatology through the lens of the poor, as you said earlier. Yeah. Uh, for a lot of people, you know, they think, well, bringing good news to the poor is telling him some religious story or telling him, you know, you'll go to heaven when you die. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the only good news to the poor that I can think of is you will no longer be poor. Yeah. So, so in that sense, you know, good news to the poor, that eschatology, something that is yet to happen, uh, but the hope is that it's holistic. It, it is uh, about life here and now, the ending of poverty, not, not the going to heaven. Good news to the poor means you will no longer be poor, you will be part of the community you'll be able to live a holistic and happy life. Well, thanks, man. Sure, yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure. <laughs>